viewers. Previously on our discussion about properties of bulk matter, we have tried to define what bulk matter is. We have also classified bulk matter into three as solid, liquid, and gas. We have also tried to define some of the basic terms like stress, strain, and modulus. As force is exerted on objects, the objects may deform. So deformation mainly can be classified depending on the orientation as tensile stress uh, or tensile deformation. There might be uh, compressional deformation, torsional deformation, as well as shear deformation. And today let's proceed on that concept and see about fluid mechanics. First, let's try to see about fluid statics, meaning the study of fluids at a given stationary objects or stationary bodies. Actually, fluid is a common name given for both liquids and gas. Fluid is a common name given for both liquids and gas. Liquids are actually matters which has a definite volume but indefinite shape. Whereas when you take gas, gas has indefinite shape as well as indefinite uh, volume. Since there is highly compressible, gas may have different volume. First, we'll try to see liquid, then gas. Under this concept, there are basic terms like liquid pressure, atmospheric pressure, absolute pressure, and so on. So we'll try to see those terms. First, when you mean by liquid pressure, suppose you have a liquid on a given container, as shown here. Here you have a container, on, and on this container you have fluid. If someone asks us to find the pressure at a given point, at a given point, you should have all considered the weight of the fluid above that specific point. Suppose if you are asked what is the pressure at this specific point, therefore your concern is all about the fluid beyond or above the uh, point, the given specific point. Or usually you might be asked that what is the pressure exerted due to this liquid or fluid at the base of the container. Here you have the base of the container and at this base of the container there will be a fluid and a force exerted and that force is all due to the weight of the fluid beyond the container or the base of the container. Therefore, generally pressure can be expressed as since pressure is a form of stress, we know that stress is given to be force to area or pressure itself is given to be force over area. And the force appears at the base of the container is due to the weight of the fluid. The weight of the fluid can be given as mass of the fluid times gravity G. This is how we determine the weight. So expressing this onto pressure P is equal to, instead of force, you might use the weight of the object. So mass times gravity divided by the cross-sectional area A. Here, the mass of the fluid is not actually given, rather uh, it is given in terms of density and volume. Usually, one liter of water might be given, not instead of uh, given mass, we are using volume. And we know that density is equal to mass over volume. From this, mass means density times volume. Therefore, expressing this density times volume, we can have instead of mass, you can have pressure P is equal to density times volume V times gravity G over cross-sectional area A. And one thing we know that the cross-sectional area times the base area times the height or the elevation is known to be, suppose if the height is all this H and here you have uh, cross-sectional area or base area. So base area times height gives us the volume the whole volume. And if you take the ratio of volume to that of cross-sectional area, it gives us the elevation or the depth, meaning the height of the water from the given point. If the point is here, the height should be from this above. If you have a base area, the height should be from the base area to the level of the water. So in this case, we might use H. And on pressure P, you have density rho, the volume of the object times gravity G over cross-sectional area A. Here you have volume to that of cross-sectional area A. Volume to cross-sectional area means elevation or height, or it might possible to say depth from a given level of water down, it's possible to say depth. 
Therefore, generally, pressure P of a liquid can be given as rho density gravity G times the elevation or the depth. This is how we determine the pressure of a liquid. Pressure of a liquid can be given as H, the depth, rho, the density of the fluid. It might be water, it might be or any other fluid times the gravity G. Rho GH is how to determine the pressure of a liquid. The pressure of a liquid generally depends on those three factors. What are those three factors? Pressure P is equal to rho G H, meaning rho is tells us about the type of the fluid. The pressure of a liquid at the base of a container or at any point depends on the type of the fluid. Density tells us the difference in fluid. Gravity, actually, as far as we are on Earth, the gravity remains constant. But if you change different planets or something, different areas where gravity might be affected, gravity is also the other factor. And the most important factor is the depth. As you go deeper and deeper, as height is increased, H is called depth. Okay, we call it to be depth. As the depth is increased, there will be higher liquid pressure, pressure increase. So pressure P is related to type of fluid, depth, and gravity. The other concept is atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure, since fluid is a common name for gas and liquid, we should have to focus for both. Previously, we have seen about the pressure of a liquid exerted at the base of the container. Now let's try to see the pressure of atmosphere at, on the Earth's surface. Here you have our precious world. There will be a pressure exerted on Earth due to the atmosphere. Okay, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is actually a blanket-like structure of different gas above us. So that will exert pressure downward on our surface. Therefore, this is given to be or known to be atmospheric pressure. And the maximum possible atmospheric pressure exerted is at sea level. Usually, when we say sea level means the maximum possible atmospheric pressure. And above that, if you are going mountainous or if you are increasing elevation, the atmospheric pressure is going to be decreased. Why? Because that pressure and depth has a relation. So from above downward, you have a depth. As you go further and further, deeper and deeper at sea level, you have higher atmospheric pressure and as you go above surface of the earth might be mountainous area or level so that the pressure is going to be decreased as elevation increases the atmospheric pressure decreases okay uh, and the maximum atmospheric pressure is given to be one atmosphere actually atmospheric pressure can be measured using different uh, units one atmosphere you might use pascal you might use torsili you might use millimeter of mercury centimeter of mercury and so on so at sea level the maximum atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere atm and it can be given as 1.01 .01 times 10 to the power of 5 pascal or easily you can use 100 1 kilo pascal is the maximum pressure above that when you are increasing elevation when you mean elevation is from a given reference frame from our surface above Okay, when you mean depth from a given surface down. So pressure has a direct relation with depth, but it has inverse relation with elevation. As you increase elevation, pressure decreases, especially atmospheric pressure decreases. Note that elevation has inverse relation with atmospheric pressure. And the other important concept is absolute pressure. Okay, so far we have seen the liquid pressure which is uh, the pressure of a liquid at the base of a container, atmospheric pressure, the pressure of the atmosphere on the Earth's surface. And now let's try to see the absolute pressure. Absolute pressure of a given um, liquid or fluid is given to be, if it is open, let's say that here you have a container and open, you have a fluid. Let's say that it might be water. So the pressure exerted at the base of the container due to only the weight of the liquid is known to be pressure of the liquid. Pressure of the liquid is related with that of density of the fluid, gravity times elevation or depth. Okay, let's say that the level of the water from the base of the container is H. So this is only due to the fluid, the weight of the fluid. But since it is open, there will be a pressure exerted by the atmosphere. The atmosphere itself exerts a pressure. So Above the level of the water, there will be atmospheric pressure. Below the level of the water, there will be liquid pressure. 
So what is the total pressure exerted at the base of the container? The total pressure at the base of the container is known to be absolute pressure, which is a combination or summation of liquid pressure and atmospheric pressure. So above this, you have atmospheric pressure. Here you have a pressure of a liquid, which is rho g h. The summation of these two is known to be absolute pressure. And absolute pressure is pressure of a liquid, rho g h, and pressure of atmosphere. Actually, pressure of the atmosphere is given depending on the uh, location. For example, at Addis Ababa, we would have a different elevation, or at somewhere place, we would have a different elevation. But at the depths, we would have the absolute and the maximum uh, atmospheric pressure, which is previously mentioned to be one atmosphere. So it is already a given quantity depending on the um, location. But here, focus on the depths. And here, we would have one good uh, exercise, and it says a very large open tank is full of oil. Now the fluid is oil, and the density of the oil is found to be 800 kilogram per meter cube. If the absolute pressure at the bottom of the tank is found to be 1.81 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal, then what is the depth of the oil? Okay, that's the question how depths or what is the elevation of the oil from the base to the level of the oil. Note that the atmospheric pressure is this. You see, 1.01 times is the power of 5 Pascal, meaning that this equation is given at sea level. Or sometimes it might be a different atmospheric pressure depending on the elevation. So to solve this, what are the given quantities? Here you have a container, and that container contains fluid and that fluid is oil. And the density of oil is, it says, 800 kilogram per meter cube. Okay. Now we are asked to find the depth of, or the level of, this uh, oil. At the base of the container, we do have absolute pressure, pressure absolute. Above that, there is Atmospheric pressure, the atmospheric pressure is also given to be 101 kilopascal or 1.01 times 10 to the power of 5 pascal. The absolute pressure at the base of the container, it says 1.81 times 10 to the power of 5 pascal. Okay, these are the given quantities. And previously we have said that absolute pressure pressure absolute is the total pressure exerted at the base of the container due to the liquid pressure and the atmospheric pressure. So the liquid pressure can be given as rho g h plus the atmospheric pressure. This was the equation that we have provided previously. Therefore, if you take this to this side, pressure absolute minus pressure of atmosphere can be given as rho g h which is pressure of a liquid. Absolute pressure is given to be 1.81 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal minus the atmospheric pressure is already given to be 1.01 times 10 to the power of 5 Pascal. Okay? And this gives us the density of the oil is found to be 800 kilogram per meter cube. So we should have to put 800 kilogram times gravity is 10 times h. So the only quantity that we didn't have is the elevation or the depth. Therefore, when we are trying to subtract this, this gives us 0 0.80 times 10 to the power of 5. Okay, 10 to the power of 5 is a common for both. Is equal to, when you multiply this, it gives us 8 times 10 to the power of 3 times h. Okay, so if you take 12 the power here, might gives us 80 times 10 to the power of 3 is equal to 8 times 10 to the power of 3 times h. 10 to the power of 3 cancelled by 10 to the power of 3. 80 divided by 8, okay, 80 divided by 8 is elevation h, so h can be given as 10, 10 meter. So the depth of the oil in the tank is 10 meter. 10 meter. Let's see the alternatives provided here. 100 meter. Here we have 10 meter, 75 meter, and so on. So your answer is 10 meter. This is 
your solution. I hope you have found a good technique of solving such kinds of problems. Now let's proceed. Here under fluid statics we have some common laws. The common laws that we are going to apply here for fluid statics are Pascal's principle and Archimedes principle. Pascal's principle is a principle proposed by a French physicist Blaise Pascal which states that a pressure exerted on a given confined fluid will be transmitted undiminished to all parts of the container. This is what it says. The pressure exerted at a given point can transmit it undiminished to all parts of the confined fluid. The fluid must be confined. There must not be a leakage so that if it is confined, if we exert a pressure at one point, that pressure will be transmitted to all parts of the container. And it's very important in today's day-to-day uh, -day activities. There are lots of uh, applications. Among that, hydraulic press is the findings of Pascal's concept. And hydraulic press is a practicable in many devices like uh, vehicles. Lots of vehicles use the concept of hydraulic press. What does it mean by hydraulic press? Here we have uh, example. Suppose that here we have a technique to lift up those uh, car. The car is actually a huge amount of weight so that this might be lifted up just by pressing a button here. And that button can be related using a fluid here. We do have a fluid, and that fluid is totally confined fluid. And it says that the pressure exerted at some point, they say at the initial point, or call it point one, is the same as the pressure here. Because of this fluid is confined, if you exert pressure here, the pressure is transmitted and diminished to all parts of the container. Therefore, the pressure exerted at smaller piston we can call it a smaller piston, is equal to the pressure exerted at the larger piston. And we have defined pressure to be force to that of cross-sectional area. And the pressure exerted here, the pressure exerted here is the force to that of cross-sectional area, force to that of cross-sectional area. Then, look here, the area is very small, and here we do have a larger piston, so that the area is very large you can find that force 2, F2, is equal to area 2 to area 1 times force 1. The difference, the ratio of area 2 to area 1, area 2 is very large, so that area 1 is very small, so the ratio of these two is somehow greater than 0 or larger number. And here we have a force F1. The ratio of these two, area 2 to area 1, is actually greater than 1. And that means this machine is a force multiplier machine. It will f multiply your force twice, three times, four times, and so on. So this is the finding of Pascal's principle. Here we have one example. It says that the cross-sectional areas of a small and a larger piston. Here we have two pistons, a smaller piston and a larger piston, uh, is given us four centimeters squared, the smaller piston, the area of a smaller piston, let's say A1, is four centimeter squared, okay? And the area of the larger piston, the larger piston is 0 0.02 meter squared. Here it gives in meter and here it gives in centimeter. Should have to be careful. And what is the magnitude of the force F? Here we have the magnitude of the force F must be applied to the smaller piston so that you can lift this object upward. Previously, we have said that as you press a button here, you can lift the car upward. A huge amount of weight can be lifted so that the force is multiplied several times depending on the ratio of area two to area one. Therefore, it asks us to find the force F, how much force is needed to lift up this weight. And that weight is given to be 15,000 Newton. It might be the car so that you can lift 15,000 Newton using how much force must be exerted on this smaller piston. So let's try to solve it together. The given variables are area of a smaller piston is found to be 4.0 centimeter squared. We should have to convert it into its standard unit into meter squared as 4 times 10 to the power of minus 4 meter 
squared. This is how we convert meter squared and centimeter squared. So four times this is the power of minus four meter squared. And the other given variable is area of the larger piston is given to be 0 0.02 meter squared. 0 0.02 meter squared. Or you can rewrite this as two times 10 to the power of minus two. Two times 10 to the power of minus two meter squared. Now you can compare. Two times 10 to the power of minus two and four times 10 to the power of minus four meter squared. And the weights, or we can call it force two, it's possible to use force two, is 15,000 15, Newton. Or we can say that it is 1.5 or 15 times 10 to the power of 3 Newton. The question is, what is the force exerted on the smaller piston? That is it. So this is what we are asked for. Solution, you have to apply Pascal's principle. It says that force 1 to that of area 1 is equal to force 2 over cross-sectional area 2. The pressure exerted at one uh, point is the same as the pressure exerted at the other point. From this, we are asked to find the force one. Force one is the force exerted on the smaller piston. So F1 is equal to, when you crisscross, area one times force two over area two. Actually, the force two is called to be weight. So we can substitute all those quantities. Area one is four times 10 to the power of minus four. And the force is 15 times 10 to the power of three over the cross-sectional area is two times 10 to the power of minus two, minus two. So when you are rearrange and calculate this, you can find a force to be 300 Newton. Actually 300 can be expressed 300 Newton. This is the answer, but you can rewrite 300 as 3.0 times 10 to the power of two Newton. You can express it like this. Therefore, this is your answer. Your answer is three times the power of two Newton. This is the applications of Pascal's principle. And now at last, let's try to see about one of the law of uh, fluid statics is Archimedes principle. It's very important law. Here you have the Archimedes principle and Archimedes principle focus on objects which are immersed in fluids. And it says that an object is totally immersed or partially immersed in a fluid will be pushed up or buoyed up by a force which is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Okay, if you immerse, suppose here you have a fluid, level of fluid, and here you have the same level. Suppose if you are trying to, to add objects, here you have object, if you immerse this object into the fluid, the fluid will be displaced, it will move upward. The first elevation is somewhere here. As the object is immersed, there will be a lift up or a displaced water. And it says that as objects are totally immersed or might be partially immersed, there will be a pushing force of the fluid. There will be a force trying to lift this object upward. And that force is known to be buoyant force. We call it to be buoyant force, buoyed up or it pushed up. So this force is known to be buoyant force. And that buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Here we have an increment in level of the water, meaning this fluid is displaced. And this displaced fluid has its own weight, weight of the displaced fluid. Weight of the displaced fluid equals to the weight of the displaced fluid. There will be a pushing force on the immersed objects. This is the concept of Archimedes principle. Actual Archimedes is famous uh, philosopher before Jesus Christ birth, and it has uh, its own famous history about the uh, king and the goldsmiths. Here you have uh, the object, it is partially immersed, okay, as this object, let's say the object and her is immersed here, there will be a pushing force upward and that force is known to be buoyant force. And the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Here it says the weight of the displaced fluid. And how do we determine the weight of the displaced fluid? Generally, we know that weight is equal to mass times gravity. Mass of the displaced fluid times gravity gives us 
the weight of the displaced fluid, and that weight of displaced fluid is equal to buoyant force. And in this case, mass of a fluid, rather than giving mass, it's possible to use volume. Density of the displaced fluid times the volume of the displaced fluid is given, and we can substitute here. Therefore, the buoyant force, or the pushing force upward, is equal to weight of the displaced fluid, and weight of displaced fluid can be given as mass of the displaced fluid times gravity, and mass of the displaced fluid can be given density of the displaced fluid, volume of the displaced fluid times gravity. Okay, It's possible to find the buoyant force as density of the displaced fluid, volume of the displaced fluid times gravity. Buoyant force, density, rho, vg, or density of the displaced fluid, volume of the displaced fluid times gravity. This is how we determine the buoyant force. Suppose sometimes, if the object is totally immersed into the fluid, the volume of the displaced fluid and the volume of the object are equal. If the object is totally immersed into a fluid, the volume of the object and the volume of the displaced fluid is equal. It's possible to resubstitute it using that density of the displaced fluid, volume of the displaced fluid times gravity is force of buoyancy or buoyant force. But if it is totally immersed, the volume of the displaced fluid can be given as the volume of the object. You can resubstitute and find that the density of the displaced fluid, the volume of the displaced fluid, instead of displaced fluid, you can use the volume of the immersed object times gravity G can be given as force of buoyancy. Sometimes force of buoyancy can be expressed using density of displaced fluid, volume of the object. And the volume of the object is equal to the volume of the displaced fluid as it is totally immersed. Keep this in your mind. Now let's try to find the real weights and apparent weights. Real weights of a given object is measured as the object is uh, measured at, in air, whereas apparent weight is as the object is immersed in a fluid. Suppose here you have a crown, and the weight of the crown measured uh, on air is somewhere here, so that that weight is known to be is known to be real weight. Suppose here you have the weight, we know that mass of the crown times gravity is the weight of the object, and there will be a tension exerted here. So tension T, downward is acting mg, tension T minus mg is, since this object is in a state of balance, it's possible to say that it is zero, okay? As you transfer this, tension T is equal to mass times gravity. Tension T is the weight of the object. Okay, the weight of the object. And this weight is known to be real weight, real weight. Weight in air is known to be real weight. But now, if you are trying to immerse this into a fluid or into a liquid, the liquid is tending to push this object upward. So you cannot measure the same weight here. Imagine if you have a spring uh, met meter uh, or spring weights, so that if you are trying to push the object upward, if you are trying to lift the object upward, the measurement will decrease. The same is true here. As you immerse it into fluid, we have said that Archimedes stated that there is a force trying to push those objects upward, and that force is known to be buoyant force. Okay? So previously, there is no any buoyant force, or the buoyant force is negligible in air. The only weight it appears to due to the uh, mass times gravity, so that that is real weight. But in this case, there will be a tension T acting upward, and there is also a buoyant force acting upward. The only force acting downward is the weight of the object, mg. Therefore, tension T can be determined as tension T plus force of buoyancy they are acting upward is equal to the force acting downward is mg. Therefore, the tension T is equal to when you transfer this mass times gravity minus force of buoyancy or buoyant force. So the tension reached here, or the Newton meter reached here, is the weight, and that weight is equal to mass times gravity minus force of buoyancy. And this weight is known to be apparent weight. We call it to be apparent weight, which is apparent weight is actually the difference between mass times gravity. Previously, we have said that this is real weight. Mass times gravity in air is real weight. So weight real or real weight minus force of buoyancy. It's possible to find such kind of relation between 
apparent weight and real weight. And this is the applications of Archimedes principle. Here, let's try to solve one example on Archimedes principle. Suppose that there is a tennis ball and let's try to immerse it into uh, water. And the tennis ball has its own um, diameter and it is six centimeter. The average density of the tennis ball is found to be 0 0.4 gram per centimeter cube. What force is required to hold it completely submerged into the water? That is a question. Let's express it figuratively. Here you have water. Let's say that this is the level of the water. If you put the tennis ball here, actually tennis ball is spherical, it cannot be immersed because that the density of the fluid, which is water, is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. Okay? Whereas the density of this is the density of the fluid, okay? Whereas the density of the tennis ball, the object, let's say the tennis ball, is 0 0.400 gram per centimeter cube. By the way, you should have to convert kilogram into kilogram meter cube into gram meter cube. You should have to have the same uh, expression. And to convert that one gram per centimeter cube is equal to 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. Don't forget this expression. One gram per centimeter cube is equivalent to that of 1,000 kilogram. I know that kilogram is, one kilogram is 1,000 gram. But you should have to be very careful in using gram per centimeter cube and kilogram per uh, meter cube. So if you are trying to convert it into its standard kilogram per meter cube, you should have to multiply this by 1,000. So if you are trying to multiply this by 1,000, the density of the tennis ball will give us 400 kilogram meter cube. Then when you are trying to compare their density, this one is 400 kilogram and this one is 1,000 kilogram. And it floats, okay? It would not be submerged. Therefore, you should have to apply force to submerge it totally. You should have to use a force. And that force should be downward. Here you have the tennis ball. And that tennis ball is immersed into the fluid due to the exertion of external force. Actually, it has a downward force previously, MG. And that object floats due to that the upward force, the force of buoyancy, is equal to that of the weight of the object or the weight of the displaced, the weight of the tennis ball. But in this case, here you have an up, a downward force as well as it has its own mass times gravity, weight, still we have an upward force, force of buoyancy. Okay? Therefore, the downward force F plus mg gives us the upward force, force of buoyancy. We are asked to find the force of the applied force. The external applied force is equal to force of buoyancy minus mass times gravity. This should be the way how to solve that uh, problem. So therefore, there should be a downward force applied on this tennis ball so that it can be totally immersed. Back here, there is 0 0.68 Newton. There is an upward force, he says. Should we apply an upward force? No. We should have to apply a downward force. So your answer should be either this one or this one. There is a downward force, but here the two upward force are not going to be your answer. You should have to choose among these two. And then let's try to calculate back. What is buoyant force means? Previously, we know that force of buoyancy can be given as density of the displaced fluid, volume of the displaced fluid times gravity. So density of displaced fluid, volume of displaced fluid times gravity minus mass times gravity means mass of the tennis ball. Mass of the tennis ball can be given as, mass can be given as density times volume. Therefore, density of the object, the tennis ball, times the volume of the object times gravity G. You can express it like this. Here, uh, since it is totally immersed, downward, totally immersed, the volume of the object is the same as the volume of the displaced fluid. Previously, we have mentioned this. 
If an object is totally immersed, the volume of the displaced fluid and the volume of the object are all the same. So we can express this as density of the displaced fluid. Instead of volume of the displaced fluid, you can use volume of the object times gravity G minus density of the object, volume of the object times gravity G. Here you do have volume of the object as a common. The only difference is density of the displaced fluid minus density of the object. As a common, we can have volume of the object times gravity G. That will be the force exerted. And here we have provided that density of the displaced fluid. Here we have the density of the uh, object or the tennis ball. And how do we determine the volume of the tennis ball? It says that the volume of a sphere can be given as 4 over 3 pi r cubed. This is how we determine the volume of the spherical objects. And the radius of the sphere is given to be, actually previously we have the diameter. It says the diameter. So when you are divided by 2, you can find the radius r. And the radius r is 3 centimeters. So 4 over 3 pi, and instead of radius r, you can use 3 centimeters. 3 means 10 to the power of minus 3. Um, 3 centimeter, r is 3 centimeters, so that you can have 3 times 10 to the power of minus 2 meter. Okay, when you convert it into meter, minus 2 meter, the whole cube. Okay, you should have to cube. So that you can find the volume of the object. So if you are trying to multiply this, you might have, you can cancel 2, 1, 6 pi times 10 to the power of, this is minus 6, okay, meter cube. This is the volume of the object. This is the volume of the tennis ball. Therefore, you do have a gravity 10. And density of the displaced fluid is already 1,000. 1,000 minus density of the object is 400 kilograms. So you should have to put it 400 times this volume, which is 216 pi times 10 to the power of minus 6, and so on. If you are trying to multiply with 10, at last you will find your answer to be uh, 0 0.68 Newton. This is your answer. And 0 0.68 Newton acting downward. It should be acting downward so that previously we have two alternatives which says downward. Here it says 1.13 Newton downward, 0 0.68 Newton downward. So your answer is 0 0.68 downward. I hope you have answered this question. And this is all uh, that I have got for today. Next time, we'll try to see about fluid dynamics. Since then, have a good time. Bye-bye.